On this episode of Business World, the cost of untreated mental health and how it affects you. According to the World Health Organization, mental illness represents the biggest economic expense of any health issue in the world, costing $2.5 trillion a year. This expenditure is projected to rise to $6 trillion by 2030, with two-thirds of these costs attributed to disability and loss of work. And yet, shockingly, of the 450 million people worldwide who suffer from mental illness, the majority, 60%, do not receive any form of care, with 90% of people in developing countries receiving no care at all. Research suggests that the majority of people hold negative attitudes and stereotypes towards people with mental illness. From a young age, children were referred to others as crazy or weird. These terms are used commonly by adults as well. Often, the negative stereotypes involve perceptions that people with mental illness are dangerous. This perception is fueled by media stories that paint violent perpetrators as mentally ill without providing the context of the broad spectrum of mental illness. This bias is not limited to people who are uninformed. In fact, some healthcare providers may hold these stereotypes. This stigma often manifests as social distancing. In particular, when people feel that an individual with mental illness is dangerous, that results in fear and increased social distance. This social distancing may result in the experience of social isolation and loneliness on the part of people with mental illness. It has long been understood that social isolation is associated with poor mental health and even early mortality. With such staggering numbers and a growing antagonistic view towards the mentally afflicted, can we afford to continue to minimize the impact of mental health care? When we come back, we will be joined by a mental health professional to help us understand what can be done. Our next guest joins us from Jewish Community Services of South Florida. With over a decade of experience as a mental health clinician, a frequent speaker in the local community, among some of these speaking engagements are the British Embassy, Miami-Dade County Public Schools, the United Way, and Carlos Albizo University. Making regular TV and radio appearances, most recently participated in the Univision panel discussion, Not One More Deaf. Please welcome Christina Lalama. Christina, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Professor. Christina, why do so many people uh, not seek mental health counseling? One of the biggest reasons that we find with um, mental health counseling or limited access to that is that people don't go for those services because of that stigma that exists. Um, a lot of them feel that if they go, people are going to label them as crazy. They're going to be probably revealing information about their family, which they were hoping to keep private. Um, also a lot because of the lack of recognition of what a mental health problem is, many people see it as a temporary issue and something that can be ignored and that will go away. Uh, but without seeking the appropriate services, we actually know that that, serv that problem is going to get bigger. How, is there like a specific uh, strategy that you use to get them in or what, what is like the, the process entail? Like, like take me through the process. Someone. Does, is this like a court ordered thing or does someone actually reach out from the family and say, hey, we need help, uh, how can you guys help us? Well, we, we get referrals for, for services from different sources. Um, some people are court ordered, depending on the situation, specifically dependency court or people that are having difficulties that maybe have resulted in arrests would be court ordered or court okay. mandated to attend therapy services. Um, others do seek it and are referred through the school services, for example, small children or um, adolescents. Uh, teachers and counselors in the school system will recognize that there are uh, a pattern of difficult problems and they will talk to the parent about bringing the child in for services. As far as other adults, usually um, they could also get referrals from their medical doctors. Right. Uh, when they think a problem is a physical ailment, they'll go to their doctor and the doctor might say, you know, this is something maybe you need some psychiatric or psychological assistance with. Wow, so that's what they call psychosomatic uh, syndrome where like you have a physical pain or ailment but it's actually coming from a mental condition? Yeah, that's correct. Wow, okay. And t uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, tr uh, there's a big word out there, there's trauma. Um, help us understand what trauma is and how it's caused and is there, is there actually a way to kind of heal the trauma and what's that process like? So 
Well, for, for trauma, depending on, a trauma is really a situation, a life event that either threatens someone's life or okay. makes them feel as if their life was threatened, or it threatens the life or well-being of someone that they love, for example, a parent or another family member. Huh. Uh, when that threat to life is there, is present, specifically for a child, um, it's very difficult to overcome. It's not one that you can easily just let go of or forget about. So right. that, we carry that uh, memory of the experience with us for a long time. Carrying that with us then impedes our regular uh, functioning on a daily basis. Wow, okay. For example, uh, trying to concentrate in school or trying to do your best at your job. So it, it really does have an impact and it leaves a big footprint on our regular uh, existence. So seeking help for trauma is a very important thing and the earlier we seek that assistance, the better. Right, and so that's uh, very, very interesting. And I, so is there, is, it, is trauma always like in your mind or is it, or what is it, the subconscious mind or, I mean, and, I, well, I don't want to assume this, but I, I would think that maybe there are certain events or, or things that may remind you or, or make you recall the traumatic event that would, uh, what's the word, trigger? Yes, the word is trigger. So that it, tell us a little bit about that. So it's, it's so overall, you're someone with trauma that's suffering from trauma constantly Con is constantly dealing with that. It's not something, does that go away or is there, are there days that, that you forget about it or how, how does it work? Or well, it, it depends, yeah. and um, mm -hmm. depending on the trauma, it also depends on what age the person experienced the trauma okay. and the level of severity of that trauma. So if, if it was a one-time thing that happened, some people are able to you know, brush by it, brush it by, right. um, ignore it. For a, for a time, and maybe if there is a triggering event. So for example, if there's a car accident, um, and for a while it may be difficult for them to get back into a car and relax and just get to their destination. Right. Um, sometimes they may not think about it if they are in a similar situation, maybe on the same road, uh, or perhaps another car screeches by them the same wow. way yeah. as their accident yeah. situation. They it. may be re-triggered and they re-experience right. that situation. Uh, for other people, when the trauma is something that's ongoing, for example, physical abuse, domestic violence, or child sexual abuse, right. uh, it's something that's not that easy to get, to get over or to forget. Uh, it kind of pops into your head without a person thinking about it. Um, it's something they can't shake off, they can't ignore. And sadly, for, for younger children and adolescents, their, their mind is not going to be focused on what they need to be focused on, such as their schoolwork or even right. just socializing with friends. So it impedes all of that. It kind of gets in the way of that development. Yeah, and it's, no, I, I totally see it. And, and I guess the, the tragic part or, or the sad part is that if they don't get help, and imagine all the potential you waste. I mean, someone that, I'm assuming it, it must stop you from your performance, right? It, it, if you're gonna be studying, it's probably gonna hinder you at some point. If you're gonna be in sports, it's gonna hinder you at some point. So, I mean, it just, it would probably be a lot of wasted potential, someone that could have done so much if they would have reached out and gotten the help and, and eventually liberate themselves from, from that painful event. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I, I can see how it's sad. And so if someone's watching this or perhaps knows someone that, that may need uh, some help, what, where can they go for help and is it expensive? Uh, I mean, how, how does it work? How, how do, how do how do we reach out? Well, for one thing, well, there is a, a wonderful service in Miami-Dade County, and it's our 211. Uh, 211 is a free service, a telephone hotline where people can call in. Uh, operators there are 24-7, 365 days a year, so they never close. Uh, and the operators do speak English, Spanish, and Creole. Oh, wow, so okay. they, can, they can definitely respond to our community needs. Right. Um, and people can call in simply with uh, a general question. You know, for example, are there free clinics in the, in the area, whether it be a medical clinic or a mental health clinic? Uh, and they would be asked their zip code, and through their zip code, they get connected to uh, a local clinic that's near them. Oh, that's uh, okay. If they have insurance, they can talk about what insurance they have, and they'll be right. connected with agencies or clinics that accept their, um, their medical insurance. Right. Um, also, we, those, uh, the 211 also operates mm -hmm. the crisis helpline and the suicide helpline. Okay. So people can call in when they are feeling in crisis, and a lot of times it's late on a Saturday night, everything right, is right. closed, yeah. friends are out, you know, or family is doing okay. other things. I could imagine it will happen like on New Year's or in Christmas Absolutely. or one of, one of the big uh, holidays where, you know, you see yourself all alone and like you start, you know, like worrying and, 
and things just come up right. Yeah, it, it's definitely, the holidays are definitely right. a time when things come up for people. And so, right, it's kind of, yeah. Yes, yeah, so they call in and they can uh, talk to an operator, um, again, completely free. It is anonymous, so they don't have to give their name. They can right. talk about what their uh, situation is, how they're feeling. If that person is suicidal, they can assist the person to seek help, to get themselves or get someone to take them to an emergency room right. for an evaluation. So what do you do? You just pick up the phone and dial like two one. That's it. Like that's two it. one one, yes. and it goes straight to. It to goes straight to line. that operator where oh, wow. okay. where they can be connected with assistance. Okay, and then let, take us to the next level. You describe the intake process. Sure. Well, going back right. to that referral source, um, when they send them, <coughs> if they had gone in uh, on a crisis basis and they were evaluated, mm -hmm. before they are discharged, the hospital or clinic where they were seen will provide them with a list of resources. Right. And many times they will contact uh, agencies to make sure they have a space to be able to see that person first thing when business opens Monday morning. Right. Um, and so that person yeah. then can be seen immediately. Right. Uh, again, if it is something where uh, somebody was referred from somebody else in the community or they just looked it up you know, on Google and they Right. found a place to go uh, what they will find is um, they'll come in if it's a minor child they need to come in with their parent or a legal guardian to right. sign consent forms okay so they're they're run through all the consent forms where everything the process of, of therapy is explained to them okay uh, how about like an adult so like let's say you know a guy walks in and you know he's thinking whoa wow are you, is this going to get to my employer? Are you guys going to tell my employer? Are you going to tell my family? Uh, things like, are you going to tell my friends? You know, things like that. Well, you know, what happens if, uh, you know, I run into this, I run into my therapist in the street? Are you going to say, hey, how are you? How's the therapy going? I mean, right. these are all like big. Those big, are genuine, big, yeah, genuine concerns, concerns for, exactly. for, for guys, I guess. You know? Yes, they, they are genuine concerns. People are <laughs> right. worried about their privacy and their confidentiality. Right. Um, again, health, whether it's mental health or physical health, is something that needs to be kept private. Right. And because of the HIPAA laws, we are required to keep everyone's information confidential. Um, so information that clinicians receive from their client will right. not be revealed to other people unless that person is wanting to hurt themselves or hurt someone else. Then we do have a law uh, right. where we are required to, to make a report. Right. But other than that, the information that is being processed, right. uh, information that's being shared, details about trauma is not going to be shared. I, I want to go back to the comment you just made, uh, unless you're going to hurt somebody else. Yes. H how do you quantify that? For example, you go to therapy and say, oh my God, I'm so mad at this person, I wish I can just beat him up. Mm -hmm. You know, is it, does that meet the standard of, you're going to call the authorities? Like someone venting. That, that, that's what I'm trying to say. Right. Or is there a higher standard that, okay, wow, this is more than venting. This is actually a, you know, an imminent threat and we have to reach out to the authorities. I, I just want people to understand, um, is there a difference? Mm -hmm. like, like, could there ever be a case where venting would be confused for, wow, he's gonna hurt someone? Okay. Well, and that, that's right. a tough one. That's a, that's a clinical call. Okay. Um, Typically, the clinician, if it's happened on with somebody that they've already known, that they've been working with, right. uh, they'll do a risk assessment. And that right. risk assessment, whether it be self-harm or harm to another person, will go through a list of questions. For example, um, you know, do you have a plan to harm that person? Or is that something that you, right. you are thinking about regularly? Do you also have the means to do so? Access to firearms or weaponry that okay. could facilitate that action. Um, and so if there is a, a reasonable uh, cause for that person to do that, if they have the means, okay. if they have a plan, then absolutely we are supposed to notify that person uh, and notify the authorities of that. Christina, thank you so much for coming. I really wish you can come back. This is an ongoing topic in our community, a pressing issue that really needs to be addressed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Friends, thank you for watching MDC TV. We'll be right back. College is a great, great college. It changed my life. Miami Dade is really like a family. They really embrace the students. They really have a way of making you feel wanted, making you feel loved, making you feel that you can really do what you desire to do. I am very happy that I came to Miami Dade College North. Wonderful faculty, um, wonderful advisors. I feel speechless because they're so good at what they do. I feel that students should not give up. They should become someone. They should, they should be in a major that they love. And Miami Day really, you know, has made a huge impact on my life for the better. I feel that everyone should do that. Everyone should take that extra step and continue their education.
come here to Miami-Dade. Miami-Dade is great. For this segment, we have Professor Richard Tapia. He's a professor of international relations and political science here at Miami-Dade College's North Campus. And we want to focus on the uh, cost, on the administration side, on the funding side, if you will, of mental, of mental health. Professors, thank you for coming. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me again. I, I always love being here hey. on Business World with, with you, Professor. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Um, Professor, this is a, a, an issue that, that is affecting our, our community. Um, and we, we, uh, earlier I talked to uh, Christina Lalama, which was a therapist, and I focus on, on the actual therapy side. But now I would like to get a feel for the administration or the funding of uh, mental health. And uh, specifically um, in the state of Florida, uh, what does funding look like for, for mental health? Well, we rank at the very bottom when it comes to mental health funding per capita. In, in fact, there's been a, uh, a recent, recent actually kind of from last year from the Tampa Bay Times, mm -hmm. a recent article that, that basically spoke about how Florida ranked compared oh. to other states when it comes to mental health funding. And we actually rank at the very, very bottom when it comes to states, 50th out of 50 states. Wow. And when you're talking about jurisdictions, we, we are second from the bottom, including our territories in Puerto Rico, Guam, and in other places. So Florida ranks at the very, very bottom. We spend about 36 dollars per student. In fact, the recent Senate bill that was supposed to increase funding for mental health and for the public school system would really only increase it about two dollars per capita mm. here in Miami-Dade County. So I believe Miami-Dade County received about 6.2 million dollars additionally for them to set up the mental health uh, department and services here in the county. But we're talking about a very minuscule increase in the amount per, per person per capita here in Miami-Dade right. County. It's definitely a very significant uh, social issue that, that's happening. Uh, that funding that you mentioned for the 6.2 million, uh, I believe Miami-Dade County has started a new mental health department. Um, what, is, what is their approach? Is it going to be more focused on maybe um, seniors or families or perhaps the homeless? Because I've, I've seen that, um, that with homelessness, there is a correlation between being homeless and being mentally ill. That's very true. In fact, if you look at the National Coalition for the Homeless, they'll show you that 20 to 25 percent of people who are homeless tend to have some type of mental illness. So it, it, it tends to be a very large portion of the population, of the homeless population, that does suffer from mental illness. Now, what the county said they're going to do with the money I believe it's going to be to hire more mental health counselors. It's about 70 additional mental health counselors that they were going to hire. They were also going to do some training sessions with the public schools to help identify, right. uh, let's say, students that may have warning signs of mental illness. Right. And some, some critics of that approach has, have, have basically raised that they need to make sure that privacy issues of the students are, are yeah. taken care of Fair in a point. way that does not violate federal law. In, in, in fact, one of the questionnaires that have come out in Collier County, not in Miami-Dade County, but I believe in Collier County, was criticized by some mental health institutes because it didn't do enough to protect the privacy rights of, of the child and of the parents and of the families involved. So that tends to be a, a major issue of concern. Another way the money is going to be used, I believe, was to increase certain security measures at, at our public schools and doing a combination of county and school board police collaboration. I believe they wanted to hire another 100 additional police officers is what they were talking about. But in many ways, the public school system and many critics of the recent Senate bill would say that the amount of money allocated was definitely grossly inadequate to address not only the needs of mental health, but security needs in the public school system. We hear about having one police officer for every school. However, many critics would say that we need one police officer per thousand students. So if you have a school, let's say a high school, that right. has 2,000, 3,000 students, you really need three police officers for that one school right. to address the needs 
of, of the school just for security concerns. But when you're talking about mental health, you, you begin to see that our, our school system is grossly underfunded statewide to deal with all of the mental health issues that, that you're having. And you know, in, in the opening segment, you spoke about the stigma that exists between mental illness and violence. And, and you're right, if you read a, a Harvard study that was done, and it was done a few years ago, and it was published in the Harvard Health Publishing. They basically did a study between mental illness and violence, and they basically showed that what, what relates to violence tended to be a variety, multiple factors, not just mental illness. In fact, when you survey most people, popular surveys, national surveys that have been done, you see that stigma of mental illness being associated with violence, with 60% of people believing that mental illness is involved with violence. But, but the reality of it, as the Harvard study showed, showed, it was just not so. It tended to be a variety of factors. It tended to be substance abuse with social stressors, homelessness, also I isolation, social isolation, right. poverty. It tended to be all of these factors kind of coming together. For instance, I, I remember a, a, a book by Malcolm Gladwell in which he spoke about what, what brings about, let's say, catastrophic failure. Yeah. The, the crashing of an airplane. It, it tends to not be one factor, but a variety of the confluence right. of factors coming together that leads to catastrophic failure. So when right. you look at violent behavior, it tends to be a, a confluence of factors that come together to, to attribute to it. But I'm afraid that this, this stigma, this taboo that people have in public has led to us really not only misunderstanding mental illness, but underfunding and really helping people with mental illness like we should treat it like any other health problem here in the state of Florida. Because mental illness is funded for people who are needy and have mental illness, a lot of it is funded through Medicaid. The state of Florida has right. not been wanting to expand Medicaid, and that tends to be a major issue. Even though we have the fund available through the Affordable Care Act, it's been right. a decision that the state legislature has done over and over again not to expand it, right. and that basically takes away additional funds for let's say community organizations or mental health institutes to be able to right. have, let's say an insurance that would cover someone who is needy to, to have Medicaid and to get the treatment that they need. And, and it's, a, it's a shame that we rank at the very bottom when it comes to mental health per capita. Professor, can you tell us a little bit about what Miami-Dade College is doing in terms of mental health? Well. We have Single Stop here at Miami-Dade College, and Single Stop really helps refer students to the adequate services that are available to them and services we have available here at the college. So if a student finds themselves needing help, if a student finds themselves in need of applying for services, they could go to Single Stop, and, and we have some great trained professionals there that would basically connect the students with the services they need. I think it's, it's important to mention that many yeah. of the services that, that are available are available through state funding and also different local options. But it's very important to, to basically increase the amount of funding that is available at the state level. As I mentioned before, right. Florida ranks at the very bottom. And part of the social contract that we have, because I really do believe in this collective self-interest of, of man. What is human nature? I believe we have a collective self-interest. It's human nature to come together. And part of the social contract is making sure that every individual is taken care of. And I really believe that we should expand Medicaid, which hasn't been expanded, even though we have the money sitting there from the Affordable Care Act, to increase the amount of services available to the needy in our community. This social contract, the reason we come together is to make sure that we take care of every human being within our society. I believe it's natural law for human beings to help one another as much as we can. And if we have the ability to do so, we should make that extra effort. So if there is a student that, that needs additional services or people in the community, right. we, we refer them to Single Stop to try to help them out here at Miami-Dade College. And we've had cases where a, a student may need help because of mental, mental illness or a student may need help because maybe they were kicked out of their house right. because of their sexual orientation and the parents didn't accept it. Wow. There's, there's a lot of pressures that our students confront that they need, that they need help. And a lot of the times we are able to connect them with the right agency using Single Stop. And we gotta continue patient. to advocate for, for mental health. Professor, thank you very much for coming. Okay. Unfortunately, we're, we're out of time. Uh, friends, thank you very much for, for watching. Uh, this is an issue that affects all of us and, and hopefully we, you know, we can participate and, 
advocate and, and together come up with, with solutions for these uh, very difficult, challenging problems in our community. Thank you.